Six months ago, we made the long journey from Oregon to Alaska. And these are our five tips about driving up to Alaska from the lower 48. Number one, be prepared. This includes having a reliable vehicle that can make that long of a trip. Make sure you have fresh oil, topped off all your fluids, and give your whole engine and truck a once over. Make sure your tires are in good condition and that your spare has air in it and you have all the equipment to change it over if you get a flat. You wanna carry some extra gas with you and an emergency vehicle kit, including jumper cables, all your fluids, tools, and first aid. And if you're towing a trailer, make sure you have a good spare and all your lights are working. So being prepared also includes having the documentation that you need in order to cross the border, as well as knowing what restrictions there are on what you can or can't bring. Some of these things include firearms, plants, animals, and food. It's also a good idea to call your bank ahead of time and let them know if you're traveling outside of the United States, if you wanna use your debit card or credit card in Canada. And number two, you need to have a plan. So when we came up for the lower 48, it's a really long drive. It's good to have a plan for food, gas, lodging, and rest stops. When we drove up, we had two vehicles and two trailers. Knowing where you're gonna stop for the night or stop for a rest stop or even stop for gas is a really good idea because if you've never been on a road before, it's hard to find somewhere to pull over a large vehicle. Also, we found it a really good habit. If you pass a gas station and you're at a half a tank or less, we went ahead and just filled up our trucks. There was times where we drive 100 miles without seeing a single gas station. One other thing to have a plan for is knowing how you're going to be able to communicate with others in case of an emergency or if you're driving more than one vehicle up. Pretty much the entire stretch through Canada, you will not have cellular service. So knowing if you're going to stop in a town and be able to get Wi-Fi or internet service to make a phone call is great. When we came up, we made sure to have walkie-talkies so we could communicate with each other. And we always tried to have a plan that morning on where we were going to stop throughout that day. That way we didn't drive too far or not drive enough. Because it's such a long trip and you may get exhausted after driving such a long day, it's just better and easier to have a plan. So number three, you want to be considerate of what time of the year you're traveling. If you're traveling during the summer, which is also the peak season when most people travel, you may want to call ahead and book where you're staying. However, if you're traveling in the winter, you may want to also check with the RV sites because it is not uncommon for them to close during the winter season. The best time of year to drive to Alaska is going to be the summertime. It can be done in the winter, but be prepared for snow and ice. Also, you want to go ahead and check the weather the whole trip up, see if there's going to be any storms along the way. Number four, road conditions. So one of the biggest hazards we ran into on the road was wild animals. We saw bears, bison, caribou, deer. We just had to be really careful, especially when we were driving at night. So the next thing we seemed to constantly run into was road construction. There's times we were waiting 15 to 20 minutes for the pilot truck to come get us to take us through. You can expect long stretches of gravel and mud. So be prepared to stop and clean off your windshield and your headlights. And if you're anything like us, you're going to run to sections of road that were affected by earthquakes and they get really, really bumpy. So number five is cost. The cost of moving or driving to Alaska is a big one. So we broke this down into four more categories. So these categories are the move itself, gas, food, and lodging. So we moved from Oregon to Alaska. So that did entail quite a bit more than if you're just traveling on a road trip. We're gonna focus more on if you're moving here. With that being said, there's lots of different ways you can approach it. We decided the best for us cost-wise was to actually physically drive all of our stuff basically into Canada and to Alaska. Driving up here, our options were to use our own vehicles and trailers or to get a U-Haul. The price for a U-Haul for us for all of our stuff was gonna be around $3,000. So we opted to buy another vehicle and a trailer for our trip. Everyone's situation's different, but we did ship a few items up here. Firearms was one of them because we couldn't drive them through Canada. Another thing we shipped was some food that wasn't appropriate to bring through Canada as well. The next huge cost is going to be gas. We drove two full-size trucks and two trailers fully loaded down, so we were getting horrible gas miles. And as soon as you cross into Canada, which the majority of your trip you're actually driving through Canada, your gas prices go way up. Next is lodging. We were lucky enough to have a trailer, so that helped us out for cooking, having a bathroom, and a place to sleep. We spent seven nights and eight days traveling here, 
Two of those nights we were able to utilize the trailer and did not need to stay at an RV park. But five of them we opted to stay at an RV park, some of them with hookups and some nights not. Okay, the next cost, which is often overlooked for a trip that long, is going to be the cost of your food. Luckily it was just two of us and we did have the trailer and were able to pack a fridge full of food, but there still is a cost there. So let's talk about the actual costs of some of these things we've just been talking about. The cost of the actual move itself is expensive. We bought a truck and a trailer come up here. We did sell those, made our money back, so that saved us a lot of money there. Shipping our firearms and shipping some of our food is another part of the actual move itself. And as you can see, gas is a very expensive part of driving up to Alaska. Especially when you get into Canada, it is not cheap for gas. The last two on the list, lodging and food, were obviously significantly cheaper and we saved on that by having the travel trailer. When we were also too, when we traveled, we were in the, kind of the off season. So a lot of the parks were able to charge us for one vehicle, just so you know. I mean, we had two trailers and two trucks. So you may be charged for two spots at an RV park like that. Food, we did eat out a little bit, but we tried to keep that to minimum and brought as much food as we could, you know, across the border and we're able to save on costs there too. So that's it. Those are our five tips on driving up to Alaska from the lower 48. We hope this video was helpful if you're thinking about making the drive, whether it be just for traveling for a little bit or if you're looking to move up here. So number three, what you want to be considerate of is what time of the year. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laughing? Because you're like this. <laughs> how, should, how should I do it? <laughs> number three. <laughs> Ooh.